Okay, so welcome. It's the 3rd of April here in New South Wales, Australia. And those of you that are here know that it's the end of uh, daylight savings. So we've had to turn our clocks uh, one hour back to make sure that we stay with the times and we're able to make sure that uh, we get to places on time. Otherwise, our clocks are going to be one hour forward when they should be one hour backwards. And that happens pretty much every uh, six months with the daylight savings going forward and then going backwards. And you know, it, it's, it's just such a, a good opportunity to share a little bit more about that, that we need to be able to stay with the times. We need to be able to read the time and make sure that uh, we are on time and we know about what's happening. And, and that's the whole understanding of the time. And, you know, Noah was a man of his time that understood the time. He was on time. God's perfect timing in preparing the ark and being able to be attuned because, you know, the reality is that God doesn't operate on our time. He's not on Kronos time, but he's on Kairos time. And Kairos time is God operating in the seasons and in his way and in his doings and things like that there. So it's important to know that that is how God operates. And, and with that sort of introduction of daylight savings and making sure that we stay on time, you know, the Bible speaks about understanding the times. Do you understand the times? Are you aware of what is happening around us? And one type of people or a particular tribe of people were the sons of Issachar. And in 1 Chronicles 12, 32, the Bible says clearly that the sons of Issachar who came to join with David in making his solid army had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. And I think it's significant in this, in this turning back of the clocks at the ending of daylight savings that I, I introduced the whole concept of understanding the times. And, you know, when we look at 1 Chronicles 12, 32, and we look at the uh, sons of Issachar, they understood the times. What does that mean? It means that they were able to discern what was happening in the world at that particular time. And at that particular time, the king of the land, King Saul, had lost his anointing because of disobedience and going into things that God had not asked him to do. He had lost his anointing. And David was anointed by God to be the king. So the sons of Issachar had the discernment to know that the anointing had left Saul and that he was no longer God's appointed person. So it's, it's quite significant because for us at this time, as much as we understand the natural time and we, we, we synchronize our natural clocks to the time of, of what's happening around us, but are we synchronizing our hearts, our spiritual clocks to God's clock, to God's timing, to what's happening around us? Are we able to discern the times that we are living in like the sons of Issachar? You know, they knew that King Saul had lost his anointing and they knew that David was God's appointed person. You know, interestingly, the name Issachar means his reward will come. So maybe God is trying to, uh, to give us some advice there and encouragement that when we are able to discern the time, there is a reward in that. Like Noah was able to discern the time, Noah was able to hear from God's voice and his reward was that he was taken away from the destruction and the judgment that came in, in, in being safe and secure in the ark. Now the other thing to consider, the other point to consider about the sons of Issachar is that they knew what Israel should do. And they knew that they had to pledge their support to David, the anointed and appointed by God. Because let's be honest, when we look around us and in part of understanding the times, you know, we need to understand that sometimes, you know, people start off well. I mean, right now, and we're going to go into it a little bit more as we unpack uh, very briefly, Second Peter chapter 3. But we've been speaking about it. We've been speaking about the false prophets. We've been speaking about the heresies. And sometimes, you know, it's coming from people, preachers that started off well. You know, people that started off well with good uh, insight and they were anointed by God. But like Saul, King Saul, somewhere down the line, that anointing left them. Somewhere down the line, they began to speak things that were not biblical. They began to teach heresies, untruths, and, and they became false prophets. 
So are we able to discern that? Are we able to understand the times? Like the sons of Issachar, they knew what Israel should do. Do you know what you should do? Are you hearing from God? Are you understanding the times that we are living in? Because it's so crucial to know that. So today, my goal in this message is for us to seek God for his understanding of the times. Not what man says, not what people says, not anything that is contradictory to the Bible. So my encouragement for you today and in unpacking today's message is that you would seek God in his word and through his Holy Spirit for the understanding of what is happening today. Because let's be honest, this is a crucial and significant time in history. Now, I've got a lot of intercessory friends, a lot of friends that are very close in the Lord, senior to me and, and quite spiritual. And they all agree that the times that we are living in today are very crucial. They are not like the times of before. Don't get me wrong. Maybe you've heard it many times in the past. Oh, yeah, we heard it. It's the end times. It's the last days and all of that. But you know what? Today, this point in history is very crucial. It's very significant because let's be honest. There's never been a time like this before in history. Look at how quick things are changing. Look at how the world has lost its morality. Look at how God has taken out of society. And this is quite significant. It's quite unique in the time that we're living in. Because there's never been a time in history like this where the concept of God is dead has come to that fruition. You know, Nietzsche, we spoke about it a, a, a few months back. How Nietzsche, uh, the evil atheist, set about to unhinge and to remove God from society. And he coined the phrase, let's promote the fact that God is dead, which wasn't a fact, but it was a lie that God is dead. And today we've reaped those seeds. We've reaped those seeds that have been sown. And this is why I'm saying that we need to know that this time in history is not like before. And if you are discerning correctly, if you are being led by God's spirit and you are in God's word, because God's word will be able to give you that wisdom. And in correctly understanding the Bible, you will be able to understand the times that we are living in. Brother, sister in Christ, it's time for us as Christians to understand where this all fits into the Bible. These evil times, this loose morality, the loss of morality, the removing of God from society, from our laws and all of that, that were founded on the Judeo-Christian values and principles that have held us together as a civil society. We need to not bury our heads in the sand and think that everything is going to be hunky-dory, that she'll be right, that everything is going to be well. Because the truth is that this is very significant. There is a battle, there is a war that is being waged against God, against you and I, the church of God. And this is why I'm saying in point number two, that we need to ready ourselves. We need to be prepared for the battle that is being waged against the church, that is being waged against God and the values and the principles of the Bible. Because today, this time that we are living in is intensified. The attack against the things of God, the Bible, us as followers of Jesus Christ has intensified. And it's not for us to be afraid. This message is not a doom and gloom message, but this is a message of encouragement to say to us, hey, you know what? All that the Bible has been teaching us is coming to pass. Hallelujah. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Some of you will know that's a, an old song that we used to sing. Because in heaven, you know what? There's no more dying there. There's no more crying there. Because we're going to be able to see our King. So for us, we need to be ready. We need to be prepared. We need to put on the whole armor of God. That's what Ephesians chapter 6 is, is telling us. And you know, in verse 12, it tells us that we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting against people around us. We're fighting against principalities, powers of darkness, evil spirits. But take hope. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5, Paul highlights to us that we have adequate weapons. The weapons of our time are not of this world. 
but they are mighty in God's hand for the pulling down of these strongholds. And what are they? They're, they're prayer, you know, they're, they're intercession. They're the word of God, the sword of the spirit. We've got that. So I want to encourage you to stand up and know that God is in control. As much as it may seem as if morality is lost, as much as it may seem as if God is being removed, you know what? He's the Alpha and the Omega, and He is in control. And, you know, in our study, when we looked at, for the last two months, on Noah, we realized how similar the times of Noah are to today. And in Noah's time, you know, we unpack that and we see how God is able to use His grace Noah found grace in God's eyes, Genesis chapter 6, verse 8. But at the same time, the world found judgment because they were not living according to how God had asked them to live and they reaped what they sowed. Romans 6, 23, we spoke about that lovely verse from Paul that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So let's be encouraged because in the days of Noah, it says that Jesus says in Matthew 24, I want to encourage you, please read Matthew 24. In verse 37, it says, Jesus says his return will be like the days of Noah. And as we've unpacked in the story of Noah, I encourage you, if you haven't heard it, please go back. It's on YouTube. It's on my Facebook. Have a listen to that series because it's been an absolute eye opener for many to see the glaring similarities in the days of Noah to today. And today, as Jesus said, as in the days of Noah, so will his second coming be. You know, I, I, there's a lovely famous preacher that says, you know, it's not that Jesus is coming. He's on the way. And according to the times, if you're able to discern the times, if you're able to not read the tea leaves, because we don't read the tea leaves. But if we read God's word, God's word is reminding us. It's showing us. It's giving us the understanding of the times of today that Jesus is on his way. And when we unpack that, similar to the days of Noah, today there is a disbelief in all things God. Because in the days of Noah, they did not want to believe in God. They relied on their flesh. They were relying on, on, on their own ways. But you look at today, we see that we believe like Noah, that God is creator and he is to be worshipped alone. And that's what Noah did. Noah focused on God. The Bible says, as we unpacked in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, that Noah was blameless. He was righteous. He was without spot. He was just. And that's what God calls us to be through his Holy Spirit. He brings us into the lifestyle of righteousness and living justly. Because that's what you know the just do. The just live by faith. In God alone. And that's the key thing that we believe God is created and needs to be worshipped alone. You know, in the time of the Roman Empire, they had no problem with people believing in, in God alone, in God, because Jesus, the one true God, was to them the, one of the many gods. But it was a big problem when the believers, the Christians, chose to believe God only, to believe God alone. And that's what happens in the world today. You can believe in Jesus. Many of the people in the world, many of the, uh, you know, the, the heresies and the false prophets and, and the false believers, you know, they believe in Jesus, but they don't believe in him alone because they still believe in the things of the world. They still get caught up in the entrapments of the world. So they believe in Jesus and, 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 and. Whereas you and I know that God calls us to worship him alone. And that's when the problem arises, when we choose to worship God alone. And as we look on, we see similar to the days of Noah to today, there is an increase in sin. And we find that so true coming across. We spoke about how uh, in the days of Noah, they tampered with the ball. They tampered with the creation. There was a pollution of the human DNA. And today we see that so many times around us. There's an altering, there's genetic modification across plants, animals, and in humans, as in the days of Noah. So it is now. And this is why I say, and I agree, that it's not that Jesus is coming, brothers and sisters, he is on his way. So we need to be prepared. And this is not a, a scare it's not fear mongering, but it's a confirming of our faith and our belief and our hope that Jesus is coming for us. 
And what has happened is that in this genetic modification, you know, the world has opened up Pandora's box. And you know Pandora's box, what's in Pandora's box? And this is why we need to be prepared for what is coming out. We look at the changing in the cycles of, of weather patterns and, and all the interference from man that is unnatural in what's taking place. And, and Jesus speaks about it in Matthew 24. And this is why I encourage you to get an understanding of the times. Start reading Matthew 24 because Jesus sets out what's going to happen and, and the signs of the coming of, of himself, the second coming and what is going to happen there. So I want to encourage you. That, you know, we need to be prepared for what comes out because mankind, the world has gone in and they've, they've altered, they, they've changed, they, they've removed God from society in our laws and in everything that we do. You know, G.K. Chesterton said this powerful, pertinent, relevant quote. He says, do not remove a fence until you know why it was put up in the first place. You know what that tells us? To unpack that very quickly, you know, it's creating serious problems when you remove fences. You're making things worse. You're opening yourself up for unintended consequences. I've got uh, people in my congregation that are farmers and they know that you don't just go taking out fences that were put there if you don't know why they were put there in the first place because practically they were there to keep out things and to keep in things. So you may take out the fence and in the morning you wake up and you realize, hey, all your flocks are gone. Your herds are gone because they've escaped or you've let in the beast. You've let in the, the carnivore that has come in and eaten up your flocks. So similarly in society, figuratively, proverbially, we need to know why God has put fences there. His commandments, his laws to not just keep things out, but also to protect us, to know that we are opening up Pandora's box when we do that. And, you know, problems occur when we ignorantly intervene without knowledge of the consequences. And brothers and sisters, that's where we are today. The times that we are living in. Man, in his noble quest to improve the world, may have altered genetics, genes here, DNA here, altered the weather patterns here and there and and if you don't believe me, go and check out geoengineering and educate yourself and know that these things are not conspiracy theories. These things are not figments of our imagination. These things are taking place right before us. And God is not pleased when we remove these fences, when we remove the, the, the reasons why he's created us. Because as I've said, it leads to serious problems. It's making things worse and we've got to be prepared for opening up Pandora's box, for the unintended consequences you know, Robert Frost in a, in a lovely poem said this year, he says, before I built a wall, I'd ask to know what I was walling in or walling out and to whom I was like to give offense. God's word may seem like a wall. God's values and his principles are there to protect us, to protect society, to protect mankind. And we've got to be so careful because by what man has done today, humankind is opened up us to God's judgment. Because we spoke about this and we said that, you know, God has called us out of the world. He's called us to be separate. But when we take part in these things, you know, we need to be drowning sin out of our life or sin drowns the life out of you. And that's what we've seen today in society that has been taken out of us. God calls us specifically not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers, not to be partners with darkness because we are light. He says to our 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17, he says, Therefore, come out, be separate, says the Lord. Christian, follower of Jesus Christ, if you're taking hands with the world, if you are joining with ungodly people, if you are joining with people that God has not asked us to be a part of, remember, friends with the world makes you an enemy of God. 